Hello everyone. Today we are going to talk about um, democracy and nationalism in Britain and France. In our last lecture we discussed how nationalists in Germany, um, or more in particular how Otto von Bismarck in Germany, had used nationalism as a way of um, undermining or weakening liberal demands for political reform um, in Germany. Um, and we're going to see something similar in Britain and France in the later 19th century. Britain and France were the two largest, most democratic countries in Europe. Um, and in that sense, they were the most liberal politically. But they also had their struggles with nationalism. So what we'll be mostly focusing on today is the tensions created by both liberal demands for further political reform and nationalist, nationalism, nationalist pride on the political systems of the United Kingdom and France. The later half of the 19th century um, led to the rise of what we today call mass politics. That is, certain technological and political changes kind of redefined uh, the political system of, of Europe in general, but most specifically of the United Kingdom and France, which had the most liberal political regimes to begin with. So the latter half of the 19th century saw a greater increase in the number of people who participated in politics. Now, what I'm referring to there mostly is the increase of people um, who actually were voting. Um, that there was a rise of, um, we already saw in France in 1848, the introduction of universal male suffrage in France. And across Europe in the late 19th century, there was a greater um, push in all countries for um if not universal male suffrage, certainly for a greater uh, expansion of the franchise as well. So mass politics, the first time in which a majority of people are participating in and voting in elections. Um, we've already discussed the influence of the Industrial Revolution on politics, society and culture in Europe in the 19th century. Um, in particular, how it created a new working class. Um, and over the course of the 19th century, the working class has become more conscious of their background, of their identity as a working class of, of um, people who have something in common politically. So that is to say, if you go to a city like Manchester, um, that the poor Irish immigrants, the poor immigrants or migrants from rural England thrown together in, in, in into that city over time, and this is just to give one example, start less to see themselves as Irish and English or Catholic and Protestant and more as part of a single working class. Um, and, and what we see is as the franchise in all countries begins to expand, as more and more people vote, these working class people begin to vote in unison and vote in terms of their class identity. We also get the emergence of organized political parties for the first time uh, in the second half of the 20th or the, of the 19th century, um, oftentimes representing different interest, interest groups as well. I mean, the most obvious example, just in the context of what I said in the previous bullet point, um, was the, the, the emergence of the Labour Party in the United Kingdom in, the 19, in 1895, uh, which was specifically created uh, to cater to the interests of the working class. But on a kind of more basic level, we also see the rise of actually organized political parties. Politics obviously wasn't new in Europe uh, in the 19th century. Indeed, going uh, in the United Kingdom, where there had been a long tradition of parliamentary debate, pol political parties of a very loose kind had existed. Um, that is to say that people oftentimes identified with one or the other political faction, but they weren't strictly organized political parties. Um, that's what we get in the late 19th century in which all members of the political party are expected to vote identically on all the same issues. So political parties become much more organized, much more coherent, um, much more uniform in terms of their political practices. We also get rising literacy levels, uh, which means more and more people can, can read. It's, it's really only in the, the 19th century that a majority of people in European countries can read for the first time. Um, and that also contributes to the fact that they are now more political, that they're not only are they able to vote, uh, but many of these people are also able to participate in, and at least by reading, political debates, political campaigns. Um, and that helps shape their own view about politics as well. And an important factor... That, that I guess also explains why the age of mass politics was different from what went before was the rise of mass journalism. Because most people can read, um, journalistic tastes are rising to cater to um, the, the needs of, of uh, or, or, or I guess the interests of the population. But it also creates an interesting kind of dynamic in politics that is still very much with us today in, in how journalism influences politics. Um, basically, 
newspapers, because they become daily newspapers, because they have to uh, provide information for readers on a daily basis, um, they essentially always have to print something. Um, and basically, you're not going to sell a newspaper if you say, well, everything was okay today, there was no news to report. And so, so the, the, what, what I'm talking about here specifically is how business interests shape politics. Because journalists have to write something, um, they have to print some kind of news, they often tend to be more critical of things that in the past um, public interest really wouldn't have been all that concerned with. One example is perhaps the, 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 the sexual morality of politicians. Um, that if there's not much happening in a news story and there's, say, someone aff an affair involving a politician, newspapers will print that in order to um, obviously sell newspapers. So it, it, it also forces changes on, on, on politicians. Essentially, newspapers, and I, and I don't mean this to sound like I'm kind of dismissive of the media. That's not what I'm going for. Um, but newspapers, if there isn't really a political problem, they, to some extent, have to create a political problem in order to sell their product. Um, and so that creates a new kind of pressure upon uh, organized politics, upon political parties, upon political leaders to kind of constantly be trying to um, change, innovate, improve in the face of these demands created by um mass journalism which of course ultimately was trying to serve private business interests at the same time so of the, the two countries we're going to look at today we'll begin with the united kingdom great britain and um, i have great underlined here because united in, in in the 19th century the united kingdom was very aware of the fact or at least was very um most citizens believed it was the greatest country in the world and um, britain had avoided any kind of political revolution in 1848 um, and the United Kingdom was basically the richest, most stable, and most liberal state in Europe. And in fact, when the revolutions of 1848 broke out across Europe, um, British citizens would look and say, well, our British subjects would look and say, well, that's because Britain is the most liberal country in the world. It's the most stable country. It, it's, 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 it's wealthy. Because we're so liberal, there is no need for revolution and reform. Um, and it kind of re-emphasized what we might call British exceptionalism, that Britain, in the minds of its subjects, um, was, was a political state far above um, the rest of Europe. Its liberalism, they also very much connected quite strongly with their Protestant background. Britain, or the United Kingdom, apart from Ireland, was entirely Protestant or largely Protestant. Um, and they felt that contrary to the fact that it was an industrious, wealthy society and also a liberal and free political system. But in the later half of the 19th century, new political tensions were going to emerge in the United Kingdom, specifically between, on the one hand, the demand for greater liberal reform. So as liberal as Britain was, it certainly did not have universal uh, suffrage, not even universal male suffrage. Um, and so the, the demand for greater political reform, but also its imperial ambition. The United Kingdom, as liberal as it was, was also in, uh, controlling the largest empire on earth. Um, and sometimes... Britain's liberal politics and its imperial politics or we might what we might frankly call nationalist politics because obviously nationalism encouraged British subjects to take a great deal of pride in their imperial um, uh, endeavors and um, oftentimes clashed so Britain as Ger as in Germany had the same kind of problems in trying to balance its liberal and nationalist uh, tendencies one example of this came in the effort to encourage um, political reform. So in 1866, the Liberal Party, and obviously by, by its name you will realise that they were more in favour of liberal politics, the Liberal Party tried to introduce a new law that would increase the number of people um, who could vote, the number of men who could vote. Uh, so led by the Prime Minister, Lord Russell. Um, there actually had been a movement called the Reform League in the United Kingdom in the 1860s, and what the Reform League was demanding was that all male household owners, so if you're a man and you own a house, that you be entitled to vote, which was, was um, uh, a relatively large section of the male population. Um, the bill introduced by the Liberal Party in 1866 wasn't quite as radical as that, but it was proposing to lower uh, the level of tax paid in order to be eligible to vote. And that's how they restricted franchise. You had to pay a certain amount of tax in order to be eligible to the vote. They wanted to reduce that tax bar to increase the number of men who could vote. But the Conservative Party voted against it. And uh, not long, and, and the Conservative Party believed that mo if, it, if it expanded the franchise, most of the new voters would vote for the Liberal Party automatically. Um, however, the following year, in 1867, the Conservatives um, 
led by their uh, Chancellor of the Exchequer, uh, Benjamin Disraeli, um, decided to actually introduce their own um, reform bill. Um, and you might be wondering what, was, what would bring about such a sudden change of mind, given that they'd opposed it the year before. Well, Disraeli, who I mentioned a second ago, believed that ultimately this reform was going to come, it, it, it couldn't be stopped, and that if the Conservative Party introduced it, they might win the gratitude of the new voters who would vote Conservative, as opposed to voting Liberal Party, um, even though the Liberal Party presents itself as representing the interests of the um, the less well-off in British society. The Conservative Party generally was the party of of um, big business, of big landowners, um, and of um, the, uh, the, the, the landed aristocracy. So did Israelis plan work out? Um, the following year there was an election and what happened? Uh, well the Liberals crushed the Conservatives. Um, that despite Israelis hopes that the working class would support uh, the Conservative Party as a sign of gratitude. In fact this is not what happened. That exactly as the Conservatives had feared. The, liberal, the, the voters tend to be much more liberal. And the Liberal Party won a huge majority in the election of 1868. Um, so the, the Reform Bill of 1867 had doubled the number of voters uh, in Britain, about about what had been about 1 million men to up to 2 million men. Uh, but in the short term, um, it was a Liberal Party, not the Conservative Party, that reaped the benefits from that change. 